Greetings everybody and welcome to Victoria Baths in Manchester, a grand old Edwardian public baths. Now what we're going to do today is have a good nosy round this absolute gem of a building. So grab your towel, put your cosy on and let's go to the baths. So yesterday I'm at Victoria Baths, Manchester's Water Palace, but I'm not just here to look at the public side of the baths, the pools and the, the Turkish baths, etc. I'm here to get behind the scenes. I'm literally behind the scenes right now, behind the baths, taking a look at the, the real secrets of Victoria Baths. But still, I don't just want to look at how it operated. I also want to look at why it was restored after it closed in the 90s and why places like this are so important to our national and cultural heritage what is it that makes Victoria Baths so special? Public bathhouses became an increasingly popular phenomenon during the 19th century, after repeated epidemics of cholera swept major cities up and down the country. And a growing sense of social consciousness meant that many authorities began looking at ways to improve health and hygiene. Wash houses combined aspects of public bathing and self-service laundry. Legislation passed in the 1840s empowered local authorities to fund public bath and wash houses in the interest of public health. Manchester itself was late in adopting the act, waiting until the 1870s. By the end of the century, however, there were 30 across the city. The jewel in the crown was Victoria Baths, not Victorian, but Edwardian, opened in 1906 to the south of the city. Construction began in 1903, High quality materials were used in its construction, including stained glass windows, terracotta and mosaic floors. And when it opened in 1906, it was described as the most splendid municipal bathing institution in the country and a water palace of which every citizen of Manchester can be proud. Starting at the top, this grand entranceway is for the first class male customers. Now you can see it's beautifully decorated with gorgeous green tiles and these sparkling stained glass windows. No expense was spared here. Even the ticket booth is something to behold. In place here are the original turnstiles, one side to go in and one side to go out. Next we come to this wonderful stairway, covered in opulent green tiles. There's mosaic fish on the floor and straight ahead there is immediate access to the pool, a first class male pool the crown jewel of the whole baths. Now in this first class entranceway, much of what you see today is actually original to when the building was first built. But when the building was first built in the first half of the 20th century, public bathhouses were segregated along the lines of gender and class. Um, so Victoria Baths actually has three separate pools. One for the first class males, another for the second class males, and a third for the females. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at each one of those individually, starting with this one here, the first class male pool, the gala pool. So apparently most of these tiles, what you see, are original to when the baths was first made. Except over in the corner, you might notice that the corner tiles over there look a little bit different. That's because there used to be steps coming down there, and in the other corner over there, and in the other two as well. Um, steps which would take people into the water. And they were replaced in the 60s with ladders. Right, so if you come down to the deep end of the pool, you can see it's six foot deep. Oh, it was six foot deep. So if I stood right, right at the bottom as I can, the water line would have come right up to here. Um, but yeah, six foot deep. Not to change units on you or anything, but um, I believe it was about 23 meters in length from one end to the other. So quite a big pool.
Right, so now we're in the second class male pool and already you can see it's a lot less glamorous than next door. Um, it's a lot smaller, uh, there's a lot less decoration in here. It's a very practical, utilitarian room. It was also a lot cheaper. You can see there's a balcony up there, but that, there is no seating up there. There would have been chairs up there for people to sit down, but there's no gala seating because this wasn't somewhere where people would come to watch competition swimming. So like I say, much cheaper, but the big gala pool next door was the, the big showpiece, the prestigious pool for the whole of Manchester. Whereas this pool and the female pool next door was for the, to serve the local area, working class people, ordinary working class people who lived in this local area. Um, so apparently it wasn't heated, the water here it was stone cold. Um, so yeah, tough times. But still, much more glamorous than any other pool I've been in. Even up until the 1960s, a lot of houses in Manchester didn't have bathrooms. And plenty of people would have come to places like Victoria Baths to wash. Bathing was required before getting in the pool, and so baths were provided in cubicles up on the balcony, and remained in place until the 1980s. At the far end, two long foot baths had a rare supply of warm water, tempting kids to jump into them between swimming lessons. Now apparently because this was an all-male environment, a lot of the men used to walk around naked. Um, so you can imagine if any of the female attendants walked in through the doors, um, suddenly all these naked men panicking and diving under the surface of the water to <laughs> hide, hide their embarrassment. Um, but yeah, so not as glamorous as the one next door, like I say, but still, how many public pools today, do you know, have stained glass windows like that? and the effort with the tiling around the side. There's another stained glass window down the other end, by the way. None, that's how many. Right, so I've come upstairs now to view the female pool, just from a different angle, really. It's on the same level as the other ones. And there it is down there. It's the smallest of all the three pools, which, what does that say about the era? But it is the most intact. As you can see, the stone steps in the corners still remain in place, whereas in the gala pool, they were replaced by ladders. Now, apparently the water in this pool was third hand. So it was used first in the gala pool, filtered, used in the second class pool, filtered again, then used in the female pool which again doesn't say very much. Um, this was really a third class pool. That's how women were viewed. However, despite being the smallest pool, despite having third class water, at least for a, a, a short period in the bath's history, um, a lot of local women, hundreds of local women, learned to swim in this very pool down here, including a lady called Sunny Lowry. And we're gonna look at her story now. Born in Longsight, local girl Sunny Lowry came to Victoria Baths frequently and developed a love for swimming, something she had a talent for. Since the mixed gender swimming wasn't allowed, Lowry was unable to compete against men in the gala pool, so concentrated her efforts on developing her long distance swimming, which soon became her passion. Encouraged to swim the English Channel, Lowry made three attempts between August 1932 and August 1933, successfully completing the enormous feat on the third go, a journey of nearly 16 hours. This swimsuit on temporary display is the actual one Lowry wore on her successful swim across the channel, a controversial two-piece that caused some observers to brand her a harlot. With its three pools, Victoria Bath's popularity soared as the decades went by. A number of swimmers here went on to make a bigger splash in the sport. Rob Derbyshire was one, competing in three Olympic Games for swimming and water polo. For him, it was quite handy, since his father was superintendent here and this whole place was where Derbyshire called home. Two children of another superintendent, Roy and Jean Botham, were the first brother and sister to swim at the same Olympic Games in Helsinki in 1952. The baths also adapted to the changing times. Mixed bathing was gradually introduced in the 1920s for families. In winter, the gala pool was covered and used as a dance hall. 
In the 1950s, it was even set for indoor bowling. The 1980s saw the end of swimming in the second class pool, when the council permanently covered it with a floor you see today, utilising it for sports of a different kind, including football, basketball and netball. So of course the women even had their own entrance, which was here just beyond the wall there. Um, and next to that is this, this very small room here, which originally was a bit of a, a waiting room possibly, um, a bit of somewhere to sit down. But in the 50s, it suddenly got this wonderful contraption right here, which is an Aerotone. The Aerotone was installed in the 1950s and operated rather like a, a jacuzzi, but on a more powerful scale. The user would descend into the deep and sit on the stool and then be blasted with water controlled by an operator stood here at this control. The water could be hot or cold, gentle or incredibly powerful. Literally, not for the faint-hearted. There was also a Turkish bath here, with three hot rooms of increasing heat, and a needle point shower where water comes at you from all directions. The Turkish bath was incredibly popular and used by all members of the community. The proper way to use them, of course, is to gradually work your way up towards the hottest room, then shower and repeat the process. This left people feeling incredibly relaxed and invigorated. Next door to the hot rooms was a cooling room, beautifully decorated with some exquisite stained glass windows. Turkish baths allowed class mingling, but they also cost extra, so for the first part of the 20th century, few working class people could afford to visit. It wasn't until the 1960s where the cost became in reach of ordinary people from the local area. Upstairs is the committee room and the superintendent's flat, where the person in charge of the baths would live with his family. In the 87 years the baths was open, only a handful of superintendents were in post, all keeping the job for a long, long time. Early restoration on the building revealed a lot of this old interior, including this wonderful wallpaper and old brickwork. A lot of the work has been done to replace rotten woodwork, as you can see, but there's still plenty more restoration to come. So that's the public side of things, but what we're going to do now is go downstairs and see exactly how this bath's operated. Downstairs we can see the underneath of the pools, sunken down into the structure. You can see the pipework running around the side that supplied the water. This one is the gala pool, and next door we have a similar layout with the second class pool. Through that dark doorway is the women's pool, However, this nice bit of plumbing is how water was brought into the pools from outside. The outbuilding where it was filtered. Right, so I'm at the rear of the baths now in this wonderful little courtyard. And it's got that fantastic Edwardian, uh, late Victorian look about the place. Very Peaky Blinders. In fact, a lot of TV shows have been filmed at the baths, including Peaky Blinders. So you might recognize bits and bobs. And from here, you can see where each of the, the three pools are. So that one down at the end there, with the raised roof and the glass roof over there, that is the gala pool, the first class pool. This one here, the second class pool. And if I swing over here a little bit, there's the female pool. Um, so what we're going to do now is go into this building, this outbuilding, which is the filtration room. This is where the action happened. Right, so this room here is where the magic happened. You have to forgive me, but there's no lighting in here. Um, so it's everything you want when you come to somewhere like this. Over on this side, you've got these wonderful filtration tanks. So water would come into one. These are filled with sand. So water would come into one, filter down through the sand, go into the next, filter down again, and again and again, until it comes out the other end reasonably clean and is recycled back into the pool system. Um, yeah, they just look beautiful. Look, there's even tiles on the walls. It's just fantastic in here. Um, it's got that lovely <laughs> damp metal smell to it, like kind of rusty smell. 
uh, with a slight hint of oil. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> now, like me, you probably saw these tanks in this wonderful bronze colour and thought, oh wow, how amazing. But apparently, these are covers they were added um, during the filming of Peaky Blinders to to give it that look. They were they were distilleries in an episode of Peaky Blinders. Whereas the baths allowed people to clean themselves, this laundry room allowed for the cleaning of sheets and clothing. Now you can imagine standing here, the hustle and bustle of this outbuilding, filled with machinery and chatter. So I think what I'm starting to realise, particularly going in the laundry room, is that I've been looking at this place as kind of, oh it's a hundred year old building. Um, but actually this is very recent living history. So people alive today would have used this pool, would have swam in this pool and been in this laundry room, been a part of the hustle and bustle of the laundry room. So you can see why it's so important that somewhere like this is saved and restored and is, is allowed to keep going through the years. When Manchester City Council decided to close the baths in 1993, there was a passionate response from the local community. Campaigners trying to prevent the closure may not have succeeded, but did rally together to begin the long road to restoration, with cleanups and open days. Even Sonny Lowry lent her support to the campaign. Restoration work began on the building in 2007 and continued for several years. By now the popularity of the project had captured the public imagination and it was regularly being used for arts and events, and even weddings. And thanks to the tireless efforts of those campaigners and the people who continue to work and volunteer here, Victoria Baths is an incredibly popular attraction, with an average of 30,000 visitors coming here every year. These days the outside of the building is eye-catching for all the right reasons. Now we can stand back and appreciate its beauty, created in an era when public buildings were still being built with a sense of civic pride. Now I've been invited here today by Historic England to the beautiful Victoria Baths, one of hundreds of sites up and down the country, currently benefiting from the government's Cultural Recovery Fund. So the Cultural Recovery Fund is the government's COVID-19 rescue package aiming to safeguard important social and heritage sites up and down the country. Now Historic England have been put in charge of distributing that throughout some of the English sites um, and you can see today just looking around why it's so important that places like this get funding and they stay open for public access and we have access to this heritage and this history as much as we can. So these things here, um, I was always aware of these when I was a kid swimming in the, the pool, um, you know, when you're holding on at the side, because that's where all the, the gubbins get stuck in it, you know, the plasters and horrible little things like that. But yeah, anyway, wonderful.